Dear guests, is this working? Dear guests, Shalom, Shalom, Erev Tov, good evening, Hyvää Ilta, which is the same thing in Finnish. It is a real pleasure to welcome you all to the Ambassador's Residence tonight um, to discuss around an issue that we are all passionate about, namely education. First, I would like to start by thanking everyone involved. Um, we had a most delightful visit to Javne Elementary School in Givat Olga, Herrera. It was a wonderful day with the enthu enthusiastic professionals, teachers, and especially the children. It was wonderful to witness the joy of learning. So, thank you so much. I also thank our trusted partners, cooperation partners, with whom we have been working uh, for a long time, from uh, Seminar Hakibu Jim and the team led by Professor Nimrod Aloni, as well as the Israel Center for Educational Innovation, its executive director, and uh, uh, Dr. Futa Fadaman and Dr. Lee Perlman, and all your colleagues. It's been really great to work with you. Dear guests, we are particularly happy to welcome um, Professor and uh, Research Director uh, of the Yuvaskula University, Madame uh, Maria Cristina Lerkanen. I feel bad because I'm turning your <laughs> my back to you all the time. Professor Lerkanen is an internationally recognized expert on early childhood education, developing reading skills, effects of motivation, teacher-student relationship, etc., etc. And um, uh, she is a sought-after speaker on all continents. So we are very, very uh, fortunate and happy that she could fit a visit to Israel to her schedule. So, welcome. University of Uvascula, Uvascula, I'm already, you know, pronouncing it like a foreigner, but it's Uvascula. It's a research university and one of the world's leading universities in the fields of learning and teaching. It has the oldest Finnish-speaking teacher training college in our country, established in 1863, before our independence, which happened 1917. The college was created by Uno Syngneus, who, was, who is often called the father of the Finnish primary school system. He was a very pragmatic, practical innovator, and Maria Cristina has shared with me some of his ideas, which I think in their simplicity are pretty um, bright, especially, or for instance, one issue was the fact that um, teacher training was uh, both for women and men in the same colleges. And the idea behind was that they will meet, maybe fall in love and marry and fill in all the small schools in Finland <laughs> because we had uh, schools of two, uh, two teachers and it did work. <laughs> it's, you know, <laughs> all over the country we had these small schools where the, usually the wife was teaching the, the elementary, uh, the first three grades and the husband was uh, teaching the older children and there were other equally practical ideas. So, um, educational research is not always rocket science. It can be something pretty down to earth. Okay, 
Now, um, I really want to speak for Uvascular. I don't know if it's a household name, but in the, in the field of education it is. It's, uh, it's really uh, been the cradle of Finnish uh, teacher training and educational uh, research. And um, it's for a good reason called the Athens of Finland. It was the cradle of the arts and sciences when those terms got Finnish words. It was the time when we didn't even have our own written proper language. And I'm, I'm sure here in Israel you can relate to this kind of issues where you start from scratch. And we started more than 150 years ago. And it's this long and cons consistent work that has brought the quality of our education to where it is today. We in Finland, you here in Israel, share the recognition of the importance of education and, um, and the belief that this is the basis for a good society. With these words, I conclude by welcoming you once more and inviting you to a most lively discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. And can I ask Professor Nimro Aloni to come up and say a few words of greetings, please. Shalom, Rulam, Erev Tov. Dear friends and colleagues, Honorable Ambassador of Finland in Israel, Anu Sarela, and distinguished guests from Finland, Professor Maria Christina Verkenen. Since we have gathered tonight to deal with language acquisition, I wish to open my greetings with two classical lines uttered by two cultural heroes. The first classic line, and please take it with a sense of humor, taken from the movie Casablanca and spoken by Humphrey Bogart goes as follows. I think this is a beginning of a beautiful friendship. Shifting now to our context, it is with great appreciation and satisfaction that I can state that it is already 10 years now of a beautiful friendship and fruitful collaboration between Kibbutzim College of Education and the Finnish Embassy in Israel. On the part of Kibbutzim College, this partnership enabled us to learn in person from many Finnish educational scholars and leaders, as well as to engage together in academic and pedagogical projects. I hope our, part, our Finnish partners have also found worthwhile the knowledge and, and insights we have contributed to this tango. The second classic line of great relevance to the presentations and discussion tonight was articulated by the famous linguistic philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. I think that from the educational point of view, wishing to empower the young towards full humanity and active engagement in democratic citizenship, one cannot exaggerate regarding the crucial role of literacy for achieving these goals. It is also worth stressing that for all of us here, the mission of promoting language acquisition goes far beyond our academic concerns. It is part and parcel of our activist pedagogy, reaching out to the less fortunate communities where educational empowerment is most needed. Finally, I want to express my thanks and appreciation to Lee Perlman of the Israel Center for Educational Innovation, to Susan Milner, the cultural attaché of the Finnish Embassy in Israel, and to my colleagues from the Faculty of Education at Kibbutzim College, Adi Sharabi and Nira Vale. Lee and Susan originated this partnership. Adi and Nira joined and in the last month, they all worked as a harmonious team to make this evening possible. 
Thank you again, Ambassador Sarella, for inviting us all to your residence for this discussion evening. And thank you again, Professor Lerken, for coming to Israel to share with us your knowledge and insight. I wish us all an enriching and inspiring evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nimrod. And can I ask Dr. Lee Perman from the ICEI to come and give your greetings, please. Good evening, everyone. Truth in advertising and exchange are the two thoughts that come to mind. Truth in advertising is that this evening is called language acquisition in school settings in Finland and Israel, inspirations, strategies, and dilemmas. And that's what we're gonna experience tonight. And we're gonna experience through an exchange that we in ICI have had the pleasure of having with you today and yesterday, it feels like much more, Professor Lurkinen and Ambassador Saurella and Suzanne, you joined us this morning in the school that you mentioned, Ambassador, the ICI school in Givar Olga. And the exchange, I think, tonight is going to be not a straightforward exchange because if it was just a nonprofit ICI with an academic colleague, world-renowned expert in a world-renowned academic institution, that would definitely be interesting and inspiring. If it was just about Finland and Israel, that would also be inspiring. But here, we've put together a program that is focusing on language acquisition in many kinds of school settings. In elementary schools, where ICI focuses our energies, in early education, where the Kibbutzim College of Education is one of the leaders, not only in teacher training, but also in field work, as well as in special education. And so there are gonna be a lot of levels and layers of the exchange tonight. The format is very straightforward. We're gonna hear a keynote from Professor Lerkunen on state of the art, and we'll hear from her. We've, you've been speaking to lots of groups, and tonight, just to focus you, our friends and colleagues of our organizations, of the Embassy, of the Kibbutzim College of Education, and of ICI. We're delighted that our board member, Professor Alice Shalvey, is here with us tonight. I think everyone in this room knows, but just to make sure that you know as well, that she receives awards left and right, including a recent award for her contributions to the State of Israel. And also, Alice, I think as we all know, it's the receiver of the Israel Prize for her lifelong contribution to education. And Alice, thank you for making the effort to coming from Jerusalem. And so we're delighted to be here with all of our colleagues from the Kibbutzim College of Education, from ICI's programmatic partners in the municipalities, a number of our colleagues from the municipalities, the nonprofits that we work with, like the Yeda Group is here tonight, and many of our philanthropic partners here. And I thank all of you for coming. And I want to thank you, Ambassador Saurella, for opening your residence, and you, Suzanne, for making this whole program, including tonight, happen. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Lee. So uh, can I ask uh, Professor Lerkanen to start her presentation? And uh, uh, Ambassador Saurella already introduced you, but I would like to just add that uh, we're delighted uh, that you come and, and share with your knowledge of uh, teaching and uh, instruction. And uh, Professor Lerkanen is the recipient of, uh, of uh, several awards, also trusted uh, uh, positions of trust in associations of uh, teacher associations in Europe, uh, recipients of, of awards also in, in um, the US, in, in Europe. Uh, as well as domestically in Finland. Uh, but uh, even though you now teach other teachers, um, it's in interesting to note that uh, Professor Lerkanen began her uh, career as a preschool teacher. The primary, sorry, primary school teacher. So she's uh, ran the whole uh, uh, gamut of uh, positions and uh, we look forward to hearing your lecture, please. Oh, 
Okay, for there. If I keep it here, a little bit distance, so is it better th this way? Yeah? Okay, yeah. So thank you for your nice uh, introduction, uh, Anu and, and uh, Suzanne. And uh, I feel very honored to be here to today. Um, it was last spring we start to plan this visit with Lee, and uh, it seems to be always so busy uh, schedule for all of us to find the perfect time to come here. But finally I'm here, I'm, and I'm very happy uh, that uh, we have shared so many interesting things together yesterday and today, visiting the schools, uh, meeting uh, uh, teachers uh, of your country, and uh, have, a, have a discuss with your colleagues about education and, and teachers' professional development. So my 20 minutes, uh, I, I think that uh, I will talk uh, uh, about uh, the Finnish uh, education and uh, uh, every time when I'm uh, speaking something about Finland, people ask also tonight uh, that what is the secret behind your success? So I think that I will uh, take the privilege to talk something about that and some reasons we think uh, that might be behind that uh, magic thing that uh, uh, we have been very successful in OECD and other international service uh, uh, like uh, uh, PEARLS and PISA and PIAC for different age groups. So, um, for example, the reading literacy, math, uh, math literacy, math skills, science, all of uh, those surveys, we have been quite, uh, quite uh, successful and uh, done quite well. So, what might be the possible, possible factors behind the success of reading literacy skills? Here, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, First of all, I have to say to you that, uh, that uh, the Finnish society uh, put a lot of uh, effort to education in our country and has done that a long time already. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, um, we invest uh, in education uh, more than any other country in the world. So the education get a lot of resources and uh, when uh, the Politicians say that we had to cut uh, the budget. People had said not from education, but everything else we can cut. And of course, uh, I, as uh, a teacher trainer and working with the schools, I'm very happy on that. Uh, and I, I like to see that it continue that way. Um, Belo um, along with that comes also the high trust to the teachers. I will talk about that a little bit more uh, later. But uh, the other thing is that the basic education uh, from the preschool up to the doctoral degrees are free of charge. So it's equal for all children. It doesn't depend ob about the family background or the socioeconomical status of the family, how far you can uh, study and uh, develop your Self. Um, what is quite interesting for foreigners usually is that uh, our school days are quite uh, um, short. So for example, uh, today we were comparing the school days in Finland and uh, in Israel and uh, we learned that uh, uh, when our first graders are at school about four hours per day, your children are much more uh, longer time and in Israel children have a lot of homework to practice at home when they go to home from school but that's not in, that's not the case in Finland so well they might have some reading and math but it takes 15 minutes or 20 minutes to do at home um, so what how that is possible um, in our observational studies we have seen that uh, when the children are at school they work very effectively uh, for their learning. So it's uh, 25, uh, 45 minutes uh, uh, learning tasks, teaching and learning, and then 15, 20 minutes break. Children go out, they play football, they play uh, with each other, they chat or do some, something, but they go out. It doesn't matter is it uh, winter or summer or whatever. We think that winter is uh, never to excuse, it's only a matter of clothing. Uh, you just go there and have some fresh air and then you come in and you start to work again. So when they are in the classroom, they work very effectively and... Uh, and uh, uh, the persistent, uh, the task persistent is very high. Um, 
There's almost no control on national testing in Finland. What does that mean? It means that we don't compare to schools or classrooms or, uh, or this, that, uh, who are the best, which are the best schools in, in the country. Actually, from our surveys and the research, and also PISA has sold, uh, shown us that the differences between the schools and different places around uh, Finland are uh, the, uh, mm, the lowest, uh, the differences are the lowest in the whole world. So actually there's no differences in the quality of teaching or the, mm, the assessment results between the schools or classrooms. And that is of course good news, so it means that the teaching is high level in every school. It doesn't uh, matter which school you go. So. Uh, then the following thing is that parents don't need to choose the school because all schools are good and the schools don't need to select the pupils uh, because the uh, teachers do a good uh, job with any kind of students. So uh, they take the students from the catchment area from uh, uh, around the school. But of course we have the assessments uh, uh, well, uh, but uh, the purpose of the assessment is for the pedagogical reasons. So that way we follow how the children learn things. And we also, that way we can identify if some child is struggling with the reading, for example, or needs some individualized support or more help to their learning. So all the school book series are, uh, have some assessments. Uh, uh, so there is, for example, six weeks, uh, weeks period where they, have some, uh, where they have the learning plan. And after that is the assessment. And the teacher used that uh, information for the pedagogical purposes. Is there something we need to repeat? Or is there some who didn't uh, understood uh, what was uh, going on? Or do, do we uh, need to do something uh, uh, again? Or uh, put more effort to some, some areas. And it's also, of course, uh, the feedback to the uh, children that uh, what they have learned. And one aim is to make very concrete to the child that what you have learned during this period. And the concrete means, for example, that with struggling readers, you uh, can say that when you came to school, you didn't know any letters. And now, after the five or six weeks, you know five letters already by name. So that means that it has to be very concrete to the child uh, uh, that uh, they feel that they have learned something and they have proceed. Even maybe someone in the classroom has proceed more, but, uh, but uh, everyone has learned something. So uh, the feedback has to be encouraging, concrete to the learning, and supportive in nature. Um, The one aim of the assessment is also, of course, uh, to recognize the need for individualized support. So uh, the special education teachers and classroom teachers in elementary school work together uh, so that uh, the special education teacher can um, have a co-teaching or te team, team teaching in the classroom, uh, maybe twice a week, or the special education teacher can take uh, uh, those children who need extra support to the small group inside the classroom or outside the classroom. Or if uh, the child has very big problems, there can be uh, individualized support from the, uh, from the special education teachers as, as well. But the early recognition is very important, and that means that the recognition starts from the kindergarten already. And that is a uh, quite new innovation that uh, it used to be 10 years ago that uh, uh, it was a huge gap between the kindergarten and school beginning. And uh, uh, parents were a little bit nervous and also children were nervous to start the school that uh, what's going to happen and do I manage to do well there and so on. But uh, the new curriculum which I was involved to do uh, that as well uh, the kindergarten and uh, the first grade teachers, they need to uh, collaborate more closely. So they have planning time uh, that uh, the, the first grade teacher knows already a lot about the children who are coming to the school next fall. 
and the kindergarten teacher is the key person uh, to find out if there is some children who need uh, support already before the school, that the school beginning would be very smooth. So nowadays uh, there is not any uh, big step to start the school, it's a smooth tra transition from kindergarten to the school, and uh, we had a pilot before, uh, pilot study before uh, that chains uh, uh, where we uh, try to find out that uh, um, does it uh, have any uh, effect to the children's learning and we find out that in uh, those peer pairs uh, where the kindergarten teacher and the uh, classroom teacher uh, plan it together the program and uh, look the continuation from kindergarten program to primary school program the children's at sea went was better in the end of the first grade than in those schools who don't collaborate with the kindergarten teachers at all. So about the teachers, you might know that our teachers are highly educated, so all of them had at least a master's degree in education, uh, and uh, uh, that means uh, five years education in the university's uh, university program. Uh, in the uh, last uh, two years uh, in their program, they specialize to some subject areas, usually one or two. If they take only one, they uh, do, it, uh, uh, do it that kind of uh, studies that they are qualified uh, to teach that subject also in secondary school. But they can have uh, uh, minor studies in more subject fields, and that way they are more specialized to teach some specific subjects in the elementary or in primary school. And the primary school teachers uh, uh, inside the school, uh, the principal is uh, not only uh, the one who is taking care of the resources of the school, but the principal is also the pedagogical leader of the school, and uh, the principal's background is always a, as a teacher. So they are teachers themselves in the beginning as well. So they know about the learning and teaching and all those things as, as well, and the uh, main, main task is to support teachers work at school and the professional development of the teachers in his or her school. Um, skip that. Some words about the new national curriculum. Uh, the one thing uh, what, which is very much a stress in new curriculum is student-centered learning and teaching, which means that uh, uh, the students' experiences, feelings, areas of interest and interaction with other children in the classroom is very, very important. So it's not that, uh, it's not value that the teacher is just uh, lecturing to the student or teaching in the traditional way, uh, but the very important uh, is to find the situations where, te where children can learn from each other uh, and uh, collaborate with each other. And you see that picture there, it's a one example from the first grade, how they do that. And you can see, uh, see that the children are actually talking to each other, not through the teacher, teachers observing the learning and also supporting the learning uh, to go for forward. So the teacher's task is to take the individual learning approaches of uh, each uh, student into consideration. And the other thing what is very important in the new curriculum is the motivation and engagement to learning. And that is also the teacher's task, to be aware of children's interest in the classroom, the individual interest, but also uh, to raise the curiosity to the new things and raise uh, the new interest and support the new interest uh, uh, areas. So uh, this is more or less uh, the overview of the first grade classrooms uh, um, uh, instruction, reading instruction or literacy instruction. Um, our teacher training programs and also the most of the school books are based uh, on uh, on the research results. So they are evidence based or evidence informed at least. And we know that uh, the reading development uh, have many factors behind. Uh, first of all, the language uh, skills development of the child and uh, the motivation to learn to read, to get uh, 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 s something out from the print, 
um, the home environment, sociocultural experiences at home and print exposure in, at home. It's a very important part of that when they come to kindergarten and come to school. That, for example, uh, is there any shared reading at home? Uh, what are the parents' attitude uh, to reading and books? Uh, uh, do they uh, go to the library, for example? Is there anything to read? at home, for example, newspapers, magazines, or children's books. And, and that kind of uh, thing, things uh, means uh, uh, the sociocultural experiences about the reading and literacy. Then the self-regulation, which is needed uh, uh, for, for the uh, good results that you have uh, uh, skill to concentrate to learning situations and uh, learning to uh, read and write uh, means a lot of work and practice and repeat and repeat and repeat. So you, uh, you need a very good self-regulation uh, self and per task persistence. So when they come to school, the basic literacy instruction nowadays, we think that it's not anymore so that uh, first we uh, we'll, we'll teach them to decode skills so that they learn to decode the words. We think that the reading comprehension is as, in, as important as the decoding skills. So how to support the reading comprehension before the child can, can read? So it uh, goes through the shared reading uh, uh, moments. So the listening comprehension strategies are the way to go the reading comprehension strategies. Because in listening comprehension practices, uh, the children are practicing the same strategies of under understanding and comprehend the text as they need when they will start to read uh, the longer text by themselves. And also the reading and writing are uh, teach uh, um, hand by hand, so we don't uh, wait that uh, they read uh, uh, good enough before we start to uh, teach spelling and writing. We start to uh, uh, teach also spelling and writing skills together with the decoding skills right uh, from, from the beginning. The one example which one teacher told me about uh, this, how to teach the spelling and writing in the beginning uh, was, uh, was very, very nice, which I like very much. Uh, she said that uh, don't correct all the time what the, te what the, the children are uh, trying to write. You don't uh, correct the child when they learn to speak. Mm, you just uh, get them to practice speaking. Uh, give the time to the child also in spelling and writing because this the o it's the only way to learn to spell and write that you try and try and try. The correction can come much later. And I like that idea that we need to give the space to the children and time for the children and not expect the, only the right answers or the perfect text right in the begin from the beginning. Uh, I think that I will go here. One thing is uh, the orthography uh, and the Finnish orthography is very transparent and simple like Hebrew as well. And uh, it helps children's learning to read in the beginning, but not later on. And we made the study together with the, our neighbor, neighboring country, Estonia, where the orthography is very much the same and the school system is the same. The only difference is that they, uh, they teach the decoding skills already in the kindergarten when we start in the first grade. And uh, we made a comparison with them that uh, even when they start the school at September, they are, of course, the children are much uh, uh, ahead of ours. But in the end of the first grade, our children, which is that uh, red, uh, uh, red line there, uh, they do much better. So what is... Uh, happening in the first grade. And uh, our doctoral student has made observational studies in the both countries and looking what are teachers doing differently in these two neighboring countries. And she found out that in Finland there's much more tailored instruction and individualized work according to skills, child skill level than in Estonia, where it's more like the same to all children and the same task uh, and uh, uh, the whole classroom uh, teaching. 
So what might be then the theoretical uh, overview of this? Uh, of course, uh, there is those uh, societal factors behind uh, factors in educational system like teacher training programs and the student related factors, uh, cognitive and uh, home environment factors as well. But when they come to school, uh, we are more interested about the learning environment at school. Of course, the learning environment at home has an effect, but the school can make a change and can uh, improve uh, uh, child skills very effectively. If, uh, uh, the classroom factors are in high level. And that means uh, that the classroom climate is positive, the teacher is sensitive to children's needs, regards for students' perspective, the management and organization of uh, uh, the activities are very clear to the children, they know what to do, so they work very effectively, and the individual, uh, individual support uh, is available, the quality of instruction is high level, and the teaching practices they use are student-centered. So it seems uh, to be that these uh, learning environment quality factors are affecting to children's motivation, engagement, uh, self-regulation, and so on, and those factors are mediating the academic outcomes. So most of all, it seems to be that uh, teachers are affecting the students' motivation to learn, and if they do that well, the academic skills come after that. So I think it's quite a nice I idea, and we have tested that also in our studies, that it seems to work. So I go uh, here. So how to make the change in teachers' behavior in the classroom? The research has uh, uh, told uh, or showed that uh, usually the professional development programs change the teachers' knowledge about the things, but that's it. So how to make something more? And uh, it's about the self-confidence, pedagogical beliefs, and school cultures which are affecting the teacher's behavior in the classroom. And we have uh, developed these kind of cycle uh, uh, recently to our professional development programs that uh, they start with the knowing and seeing, so they have some reading and expert lecture and maybe some video examples, and they, then they go to their classrooms and they try those new things and they videotape, they tape, video record their own practices, and then uh, they send those video clips, uh, the best, uh, best video clips uh, to the um, mentoring teacher, and then uh, in, they have uh, workshop meetings where they are reflec reflecting those best uh, practices together with their colleagues. And that seems to make actually the difference in their behavior. And then they start again. The new, they take the new aim and they find the knowledge on that and uh, study that a little bit, find examples on that. They go to their own classroom, try that, videotape that, share that with the colleagues and discuss and reflect what why the children were so motivated, what I did well, and you get all the time the feedback from your colleagues as well. So at least uh, it seems to have one way to go. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Professor Lerkonen, and uh, can I invite please Don Futeman, CEO of ICEI. Thank you, Ambassador Sarella, for your hospitality, and Suzanne for helping to make this visit happen. Thank you, Professor Lerikin, and it's been a pleasure. We've been together for two days, but it feels like a month, and we've, uh, we've learned a great deal already. We've learned so much. I think for us what's very exciting is to see a lot of the assumptions that we've been operating on reaffirmed by what we are learning about education in Finland and how language is taught, which is really at the core of our mission as well, and to see that there's still a lot for us to learn. So we are waiting to come see some Finnish schools and see what we can bring back. Um, I want to zoom out uh, for a minute. Uh, this way, okay, so you can see the... Oh, that's all right, we're not going to look at that too much anyway. Um, 
Zoom out for a minute and say that, that we see one of the greatest challenges facing uh, Israel's education system today is the correlation between socioeconomic status and outcomes. Almost across the board, we see low outcomes in high poverty areas and poor schools. We see better outcomes in the middle, and we see the best outcomes in the wealthiest schools. And that is a, uh, a challenge for Israeli society for today and for the future. And we think uh, the clock is ticking, that if we don't deal with this soon, we are going to be creating a problem for generations to come, not just for right now. Uh, we started uh, getting involved in this about 12 years ago uh, through, a through a foundation that I represent, the Mariah Fund, uh, together with the Fidel Association. Dr. Nagis Mangesh is the founder of that organization, is here. And we asked ourselves a simple question. Why are the Ethiopian Israeli children in our school system consistently, consistently having such low achievement levels? Why within the Jewish sector are their outcomes year after year the lowest of any group? Again, we always had individual children who were exceeding, who were doing very, very well. But as a group, the outcomes were very disappointing, and there were many programs, there were many efforts to try to help them. There were all kinds of remedial efforts, there were all kinds of enrichment programs, and it was not doing the job. So we started to look at schools that were succeeding better here in Israel. We went to the United States and looked at schools that were succeeding in low-income areas, despite all odds. Or were, or were succeeding with immigrant populations despite all odds. And at every one we said, what are you doing differently? Why is your school different than the school across the street where the results are still so bad, where the school culture is still so destructive? And we heard again and again, you must focus on language. You must give these kids the language skills. Now over the years that we've been working since we, from the outset, and because the, our, our allies in the Ethiopian community told us they no longer wanted parallel tracks, they wanted integrated programs, we've always worked with all the kids in the schools that we've been in. And we've seen that this problem of weak language skills is not unique to the Ethiopian community. They had an additional challenge that except for a small cadre of urbanized or educated elite within the community, the majority of the immigrants came from poor villages and were illiterate. So they could not read or write in any language. And so, as you mentioned, the home was not there. There was no culture of reading books in the house. There were no books in the house. And there were no readers in the house. So children had no role models. Nobody was reading to them or inviting them to engage in language or the, promoting their higher order thinking verbally from an early age like most of our children are. So very quickly, and I'll ask uh, afterwards uh, Eti Buchspan, who is our director of education, our pedagogical director, to go into some details, give you a couple of examples. We don't have very much time. But we built a model to go into a school, uh, first of all, to do on-site professional development of teachers. As, as you mentioned, Professor Larkin, and the teachers have to both know how to teach more effectively and they have to have the confidence that they're going to succeed. They also have to believe that the children are going to succeed. One of the things we saw across the board was very low expectations. The teachers did not expect the children to succeed. The children did not expect they would succeed. Twelve years ago when he asked these children what they wanted to be, at least the Ethiopian Israeli children said security guards are cleaning women because that's what their parents were. Those are the only jobs that they could get. Today when we ask them, they say they want to be, go into high tech, they want to be professors, they want to be lawyers. So we can see aspirations can change in a very short time. We brought into the school with, uh, uh, in, in cooperation with our partners at the Ministry of Education, uh, particularly with the Department of Elementary Education, we brought into every school a full-time literacy instructional coach to support the teachers on site under actual classroom conditions. We enrich the classroom environment. We want these kids to read, and we want them to read a lot. So we put in 500 to 1,000 books in every single class. The books were leveled by difficulty, so the children could be reading at their just right level at any time. We didn't want to hold back the high flyers, the high achievers. We didn't want to frustrate the, the struggling learners. We also tracked the student progress. We collect a lot of data. We created a very friendly, I think the most user-friendly system for collecting and assessing data. And we taught the teachers how to use that data to design their instruction, not to judge them. We wouldn't want to hand out grades for the teachers. We wanted them to understand how they could help every child advance. 
and really individualize or differentiate the instruction as much as they possibly could within the class. We also saw that the four modes of learning, reading, writing, speaking, and, and listening, which is the core of literacy, all support each other. And we had to teach the teachers how to use one to strengthen the other and not see them as, se as separate islands or as something you do linearly. First teaching reading and only later writing. Speaking supports writing. Writing supports reading and on and on. We also discovered that children learn in different modalities. Children learn visually, children learn through auditory means, they learn tactilely, they learn kinesthetically. And we try to teach the teachers to use all of those modalities. Teachers tend to focus on the visual. That's what we're good at. We're good at pointing at the screen. We wanted them to find other ways to reach the children. The children would come forward and they would connect to the modality that was most relevant for them. We also worked with the parents because we knew that the home had to be the partner in this. The children are home much more than they're in school. For our first target population, the Ethiopian population, we had parents who had no experience with schools. So using Migashrim to go into the homes and teaching the parents how to support the children's education in the home, how to create a study area, how to sit with a child with a book even if they couldn't read that book, but to engage in a conversation and to encourage the child to study, to invest, to learn, again, working on their motivation, trying to link the strength of the nexus between the school and the home. These were the keys of what we're doing. Of course, what I didn't mention was you work with the principal. Everyone knows that the most important person in any school is the principal, and that's where you have to begin. So every principal gets a principal mentor, and the principal mentor helps the principal take ownership of this whole process. So over time, what we've seen is that we can strengthen the children's engagement. We can increase their motivation. We can encourage them to read and write. We'll have special activities like an annual writing competition. Last year, we got 1,000 stories. Next month, we're publishing a book of 28 stories with Yediot Sfarim, all written by children in our competition, all from children living in low-income schools. Then they will see that then other children will see that, and again, that will strengthen the motivation and feed into the whole cycle. So we couldn't do this without a lot of partners, and I see some of our partners here in the room tonight, our partners from Yeda, our, some of our philanthropic partners, uh, Gila Kroll from the Ministry of Education. We work together, and we think that this is a potential to level the playing field. Education is ultimately the great equalizer, and for low-income populations in this country, we think it's the only equalizer. It's the only opportunity they are going to have to compete in this society. So today, we started with Ethiopian Israeli kids and we still are focused on that population, but today we've expanded that mandate to any low-income school to help the children in Israel. Again, literacy is the key, education is the way, and working together we think it's possible to make a lot of progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam Futterman. Uh, please, Eti Buchspein, Director of Education at the ICEI. Anida Berivrit, Slicha. I will speak Hebrew, it's okay. Vaniavi Beetsem, Stei Dugmaot, Shalosh Dugmaot, Mi Mashati Er Dan. Uh, כפי שהן באות לידי ביטוי בתוכנית שלנו. Uh, ואני אומר מה השינויים בעצם שאנחנו זיהינו את גורמי המפתח בהוראת השפה שהם uh, משחקנים משח, מאוד מרכזיים בתהליך של הכשרת מורים uh, בתחום שפה. אחד הדברים הראשונים שראינו שהדבר שהכי מקדם את רכישת הקריאה בכיתות הנמוכות זה הסוגיה שהרבה מורים, הרבה מורים אה, תופסים את הוראת הקריאה כתהליך ליניארי שקודם מלמדים את הצירופים, את התנועות ואחר כך את המילים ואחר כך את הטקסטים ואחר כך לומדים לכתוב ברגע שהם יודעים לדייק ואחר כך קוראים ספרים וכולי ואחר כך לומדים הבנת הנקרא אנחנו uh, שינינו את, הליניה, את התפיסה הליניארית של ההוראה. אצלנו מתחילים לכתוב מהיום הראשון שהם נכנסים לכיתה א', גם אם הם לא קוראים, כותבים מדויק. 
אנחנו יודעים שהכתיבה מהרגע הראשון תומכת ברכישת הקריאה, ולכן, רק אם אני מסתכלת על הנושא של כתיבה וקריאה, אלה שני נושאים שאם מתחילים אותם מההתחלה, הם עושים שינוי מאוד גדול במהירות רכישת הקריאה בכיתה א'. אז זה נושא אחד. נושא שני שראינו שמאוד מאוד משמעותי, זה הנושא של הרחבת אוצר מילים. הנושא של הרחבת מיל... אוצר מילים זו סוגיה שהיא מאוד משמעותית גם בשטף קריאה, גם בדיוק קריאה וגם בהבנת הנקרא. הנושא של אוצר מילים, אנחנו יודעים שתלמידים שבאים מסטט... מאוכלוסיות עם חסכים לשוניים, יש חסך גדול מאוד שהוא כמעט... שליש מהידע של תלמידים שבאים מבתים, שהצד האורייני מפותח שם יותר, ופוגשים ספרים וכולי. ולכן הסוגיה של אוצר מילים, היא מתרחשת אצלנו בכל תחומי הדת, לא רק בשיעורי עברית, אלא גם בשיעורי מתמטיקה, גם בשיעורי מדעים. אנחנו מאוד מקפידים ועוסקים הרבה מאוד באוצ... בהרחבה של אוצר מילים, אבל לא רק מהבחינה שהתלמיד... לומד לזהות מילים, אלא גם לומד איך להשתמש ולהפוך את, ה... את הלקסיקון אה, ה... של המילים שלו לפעיל וידוע תוך כדי עבודה. אז זה הנושא השני, והנושא האחרון והשלישי שאני רוצה להדגיש, זו הסוגיה של, אה, אה, של העצמת מורים. הנושא של העצמת מורים הוא מאוד משמעותי. כפי שדן אמר, אנחנו באים הרבה פעמים לבתי ספר ואנחנו שומעים הרבה מאוד סיפורים שההורים של הילדים האלה, במיוחד בבתי ספר שהסטטוס הסוציו-אקונומי נמוך, אנחנו שומעים הרבה סיפורים עצובים שהם אמיתיים מאוד על משפחות, על ילדים, ואנחנו עובדים על זה בצורה מאוד מפורשת. הנושא של העצמה של מורים, שהם יכולים גם עם התלמידים האלה, וגם של התלמידים עצמם, שהם יכולים והם צריכים ולא מוותרים, לא מוותרים, פשוט לא מוותרים. אנחנו אומרים, הסיפורים הם חשובים, אנחנו ניקח אותם בחשבון, אנחנו נכיל את כל הרכיבים המורכבים האלה, אבל לעשות, לא לוותר בנושא של רכישת קריאה. אצלנו בבתי ספר שלנו, באמצע שנה של כיתה א', כבר במרץ, התלמידים מסיימים את תהליך רכישת הקוד הגרפי, כלומר, הסוגיה של הקידוד מסתיימת כבר באמצע שנת הלימודים, כלומר, הרבה יותר מוקדם מהרגיל. בתוצאות שאנחנו מסתכלים בנתונים של סוף כיתה א', אנחנו זיהינו שהצלחנו לטשטש את הקשר הגורדי הזה בין סטטוס סוציו-אקונומי לבין הישגים ברכישת קריאה, ועל זה גאוותנו. אז תודה. We have two more speakers, and then Lee will lead us in a concluding a question and answering session. So don't worry if uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions later. And with Dr. Nira Balev, who is from Seminara Kibbutzim, Director of Early Childhood Education. Please. Erev Tov. Ani s'mecha meod liot po. Gam itrgeshet k'tzat. Ani rutsa atchil besipur. לפני כ-12 שנים, חברה טובה שלי מנצרת, ערבייה, סיפרה לי שהיא נסעה בערב יום העצמאות עם הילדים שלה במכונית. ולפתע היו אה, יריות וזיקוקי דינור, והיא שאלה את הילדים שישבו מאחורנית באוטו, ילדים, אתם יודעים מה זה? והילדה בת ה-11 אמרה, אה, ah, זה בטח איזה חתונה שיורים אצלנו. והילד בן הארבע אמר, לא, לא, הגננת בגן אמרה, שזה יום שהיהודים מאוד שמחים, אבל אנחנו הערבים מאוד עצובים. אז זה חלק מהקונטקסט המורכב מאוד הישראלי, ואני מניחה שקונטקסט מורכב קיים היום במדינות נוספות, אולי גם בפינלנד. 
אני את המורכבות הזאת מחפשת איך להביא לתוך הכשרת הגננות שלנו, וחלק מזה אני אגע בו עכשיו. איך תעביר לי? אוקיי. שני ערוצים מרכזיים מובילים את ההכשרה של הגננות בהקשר של השפה והשיח. האחד, מיומנויות ו... שמוטמעות, ידע ומיומנויות שמוטמעים בד בבד עם שינויים של עמדות. השני, תהליכים התפתחותיים מקצועיים, דיאלוגיים שמתרחשים במעבר מאני לאנחנו לאחרים. שני הערוצים האלה שלובים זה בזה, הם אינם תהליך ליניארי והם חלק מהתוכניות שלנו בתוך הקורסים. בשפה, קורס אה, אה, נעשית הבנייה של ידע על ידי מספר רב מאוד של תהליכים עם הסטודנטיות. באיסוף של ידע על אוכלוסיות שונות בישראל, במפגש חווייתי עם יוצאי העדה האתיופית במוזיאון ארץ ישראל שמעבר לכביש אצלנו, בשלטים שונים שהסטודנטיות קוראות על ה... אפילו בנוף הלשוני במכללה, ששם גילו אגב שיש שלט אחד רק שכתוב בערבית, וכן גם בהזדמנויות שעולות מתוך השיח וההתנסות של הסטודנטיות עצמן. אחת הסטודנטיות ממוצא אתיופי שאלה את המרצה, איך זה יכול להיות שיש אנשים שההגייה של שפת האם שלהם הוכחדה בעברית, ויש כאלה שזה נשאר. וזאת הייתה הזדמנות לדבר על סטטוס של שפה ועל כמה הסטטוס של השפה האתיופית הוא נמוך. הקורס הזה הוא הזדמנות ל... ללמוד על החברה הישראלית, על... על המורכבות, על לכידות, על זהות, על שייכות ועל זה ששפה היא הרבה יותר מרק מילים ודיבור. חלק מהעבודה שלנו נעשית בהקשבה לילדים. אנחנו יודעים שתרבות הילדים היא אחרת מתרבות המבוגרים, ועל אף שאנחנו היינו פעם ילדים, אנחנו קצת התרחקנו מזה. והקורס הזה, עוד אחד, עוד אחד, הקורס הזה בעצם מצאנו שכ-50% מהסטודנטיות מגלות, וגם להפתעת המרצה של הקורס מגלים שה... מחשבות שלהם על מה עולה בשיח של הילדים אחר מאוד ממה שקיים בתוך, ה... בתוך השיח עצמו. למשל, סטודנטית עקבה אחרי הילדים בטיול וגילתה שהילדים לא מדברים על העצים והפרחים והפרפרים, אלא הם עסוקים בהמשך של הסיפור הסוציו-דרמטי שהם התחילו אותו בגן. ועוד דוגמה, אם מקשיבים לשיח של ילדים, איך מדברים עם ילדים, איך משוחחים עם ילדים. מרבית הגננות בישראל, לפחות השיח שלהן עם ילדים הוא שיח מאוד, אה, אה, שיח מאוד היררכי, הוא שיח שלא אה, מביא אפשרות לשיח עם ילדים. הן שואלות שאלות שהתשובות עליהן ידועות מראש, הן שואלות שוב ושוב כדי לקבל את אותה תשובה מדויקת שאליה הן שואפות. והקורס הזה בעצם, הסטודנטיות מתנסות, אני מביאה פה איזו דוגמה מאוד קטנה, באיזשהו ניסיון אישי, ואחר כך בניסיון כיתתי, שבו הם ראו תוכנית בטלוויזיה עם ירון לונדון אה, משוחח עם ילדים, ומזה הם חילצו ידע איך בעצם אה, כדאי לדבר עם ילדים, איך להזמין אותם, איזה סטינג לבנות. אנחנו מאוד מאוד מקווים שזה באמת יעשה שינוי בשיח של גננות עם ילדים. ועוד רגע. אינטגרציה. קיימת בתוך ההכשרה, בתוך ההדרכה הפדגוגית. בשנה ג' יש עבודה מאוד מאוד מעניינת על הנרטיב שלי, שבעצם יוצרת אינטגרציה בין התיאוריה לבין הפרקטיקה. 
אני אביא כאן דוגמה, דוגמה ואתם תנסו לעקוב אחרי העקרונות שרשומים. לפני כשבועיים, סטודנטית שלנו, שמאוד מאתגרת אותנו כבר שלוש שנים, הביאה סיפור לכיתה על מורה למוזיקה שצועקת על הילדים בגן. והסטודנטית התווכחה איתה, ותוך כדי הוויכוח, המורה למוזיקה אמרה, יש גישות חדשות בעיר, אבל אני לא מודעת לגישות החדשות ולא משתפים אותי בהן. בהמשך, הסטודנטית כתבה את, ה... את הסיפור וכתבה את נקודת המבט שלה על הסיפור ואת נקודת המבט של הגננת על הסיפור. מה שהיא שכחה לכתוב זה את נקודת המבט של המורה למוזיקה על הסיפור. וכשהיה דיון בכיתה, לאט לאט בתוך התהליך, הסטודנטיות האחרות כתבו את נקודת המבט חיפשו את נקודת המבט של המורה למוזיקה, וכאן התפתח דיון על הבדלים של גישות. מתוך הדיון הזה נבע שיח בכיתה ולימוד על הבדלים של גישות ועמדות, כולל מודלים של איך לעשות את זה. אז אני כמעט עומדת בזמן. תעבירי לי עוד אחד. המשימה היא, לא, לא, שירי כאן. המשימה היא בעצם איך... איך לעשות את מה שאנחנו מדברים עליו? זאת, זאת אמנות מאוד מאוד מורכבת, איך לעשות את זה בתוך האקדמיה. המשימה היא איך ליצור שינוי בגישה, איך לחלץ את הידע מתוך מה שהסטודנטיות עושות, ולעשות בעצם קהילה לומדת של הסטודנטיות עצמן בתוך העבודה שלהן במכללה, כדי שזה יכשיר אותן להיות לומדות להמשך חייהן. אז אם אנחנו חושבים על, על הגננות לעתיד, איך נחדד את הזהות המקצועית של הסטודנטיות שלנו בהכשרת הגננות? יש לנו הרבה מאוד מחשבות על איך נוכל בעצם לגעת בהן, איך ניצור את השינוי, באיזה אופן ניצור את התשתית כדי ליצור את השינוי בהכשרה. תודה רבה. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to invite Dr. Adi Sharabi, also from the Seminar HaKibutzim, who is the head of the Special Education Department. Please. Good evening, Ambassador Anu Sarel, Professor Larkenan, colleagues and friends. אז גם אני אדבר בעברית. ערב טוב לכולם. אני שמחה על ההזדמנות להציג כאן הערב תהליכים בהכשרה להוראה בחינוך המיוחד בתחום האוריינות העברית והמתמטית. במחלקה לחינוך מיוחד לומדים כ-450 סטודנטיות וסטודנטים. זו בעצם המחלקה המובילה בתחום הזה בארץ. אז בעצם בהכשרה, אנחנו מדברים על הכשרת מורות בחינוך המיוחד, יש לנו אתגר כפול. האתגר הראשון הוא בעצם הכש... בתחום השפה כמובן, האתגר הראשון הוא להכשיר את הסטודנטיות אה, ב... בתחום האוריינות השפתית, האוריינות האקדמית, שקשורה בעצם לשפה שלהן. האתגר השני, והוא המורכב יותר, הוא להכשיר את הסטודנטיות ללמד אה, תלמידים אה, הוראה, ובמקרה שלנו בחינוך המיוחד הוראה מותאמת, בקריאה ובמתמטיקה. ומה שזה אומר, שאנחנו צריכים לדאוג שהם יכירו את השפה בצורה אה, מקיפה, מעמיקה, על היבטיה השונים, גם את תחום המתמטיקה, כדי שהם יוכלו ללמד תלמידים קריאה וכתיבה. צריך לזכור שבחינוך המיוחד יש לנו אתגר אה, עוד יותר אה, רציני. כי יש תלמידים שלומדים אה, מגיל, אה, מגיל הגן, אה, אנחנו עובדים עם אה, תלמידים מגיל 6 עד גיל 21, ויש תלמידים שרוכשים שפה, שפה דבורה וכתובה, גם בגילאים מבוגרים. ואז צריך אה, כמובן להתייחס גם לגיל הכרונולוגי וגם למקום שבו התלמיד עומד מבחינת הידע שלו בקריאה ובמתמטיקה. 
כדי להתגבר על ה-challenges האלו, על האתגרים, אנחנו uh, כמובן uh, מלמדים בקורסים שונים את הנושא של אוריינות אקדמית ואת ההוראה uh, מותאמת בקריאה ובמתמטיקה. והיום, בדקות שנותרו לי, אני ארצה לדבר על הסדנאות להוראה, uh, להוראת, uh, uh, להוראה מותאמת בקריאה ובמתמטיקה, uh, שהם בעצם uh, הלכה למעשה uh, נותנות ביטוי הלכה למעשה לכל מה שאנחנו צריכים בהכשרה. אנחנו מקיימים במכללה שש סדנאות מקבילות, שלוש בקריאה ושלוש במתמטיקה, בהנחיית מרצות מומחיות בתחומן שיושבות כאן היום. ימי רביעי במכללה הם ימים מאוד שמחים ומרגשים. בשעה עשר בבוקר מגיעים תלמידים משני בתי ספר בעיר חולון, תלמידים מבית ספר לחינוך רגיל בכיתות ב' וג'. הם, הם מגיעים למכללה אחרי שהם אותרו בבית הספר עם פערים בקריאה ובמתמטיקה, בחלקם עם פערים תרבותיים, שפתיים וממצב סוציו-אקונומי נמוך. יש גם תלמידים, בחלקם שהם עולים חדשים, ממשפחות דו-לשוניות. הם מגיעים לשיעור של שעה וחצי, שזה בעצם שיעור כפול בבית הספר, היא מלווה מבית הספר, הרבה פעמים מחנכת הכיתה, והסטודנטים מגיעים שעה וחצי לפני כן לקורס מלווה לסדנה. פורמט ההוראה בסדנה, כפי שהוא מתנהל במכללת סמינר הקיבוצים, הוא מיוחד וייחודי, והוא בעצם לוקח בחשבון תהליכים מקבילים שעוברים הסטודנטים כחלק מהכשרתם להוראה, ותהליכים שעוברים התלמידים כחלק מתהליך רכישת השפה הכתובה והמתמטיקה. הסדנה... הסדנה מושתתת על מספר עקרונות, זה השקף הקודם, תודה, ביניהם על בניית תוכנית מותאמת על פי עקרונות מודל ה-RTI, מודל חינוכי שאומץ על ידי מחנכים וחוקרים בעולם ובארץ, וב-DSM 5 הוא משלים את מודל הפער באיתור תלמידים עם הפרעות למידה ספציפיות. התוכנית מתקשרת לתוכנית הלימודים של משרד החינוך, והחשוב ביותר זה שהיא חלק מתוכנית כללית של הילד אה, בבית הספר. הקשר עם בית הספר הוא קשר מאוד מאוד משמעותי. יש שימת דגש על למידה אחרת בהתייחס לתפקודי הלומד במאה ה-21, ונעשה שימוש מושכל בטכנולוגיות ובטכנולוגיות סיוע. אה, התוכנית זכתה זו הפעם השנייה בשלוש שנים האחרונות בתמיכת משרד החינוך, בהמשך לקול קורא ליוזמות של אקדמיה שדה. העיקרון הנוסף והחשוב בפעילות בסדנה הוא תהליכים מקבילים של למידה והעצמה, במרכזם תהליכים שעוברים הסטודנט והתלמיד. יש למידה במקביל של הסטודנט שלומד איך ללמד ואיך להתאים את ההוראה לצרכים של התלמיד בהנחיית המרצה, ושל התלמיד שלומד באופן ישיר עם הסטודנט תוך מעורבות והנחיה של המרצה. ומה שאפשר לראות כאן בצילומים זה את המרצות בעצם מלמדות את התלמיד באמצעות אסטרטגיה, והתל... והסטודנט לומד בזמן אמת איך בעצם זה תהליך של מודלינג, איך ללמד. אז השיעור אה, של השעה וחצי מחולק לשלושה חלקים, אה, פתיחה קצרה במליאה, הוראה יחידנית וסיכום במליאה. בפתיחה מתקיימת פעילות שמתכננים הסטודנטים, שהמטרה העיקרית שלה היא חברתית אה, ומוטיבציונית, וקישור לנלמד בבית הספר. התלמידים הם מאותה שכבת גיל, אז כאן ההתייחסות היא יותר למשותף ופחות למייחיד. כשלב שני, אה, שהוא בעצם מרכז העשייה בסדנה, יש התמקדות בהוראה יחידנית מותאמת. הסטודנט בהנחיית המרצה בונה תוכנית התערבות אישית שמטרתה מעבר לכל להעצים את התלמיד, להעלות את תחושת המסוגלות העצמית שלו, הכללית והלימודית, את הדימוי העצמי שלו, וכך גם באמת להעלות את המוטיבציה שלו ללמידה. אני חייבת להגיד שבתמונות הילדים מטושטשים, אז אי אפשר לראות את החיוכים שלהם, אבל התהליך של העצמה הוא תהליך של העצמה שקורה גם אצל הסטודנטים. והבנו גם מההרצאות הקודמות כמה זה חשוב שמורים אה, יהיו עם תחושת אה, מסוגלות אה, גבוהה. אה, המפגש של השיעור הכפול בעצם מאפשר יישום 
של מודל ה-RTI, ובהתאם למודל, בהתבסס על מבדק מקיף, אני לא ארחיב כאן כי באמת אין לי זמן, אבל מה שחשוב לשים לב זה שבמודל הזה יש לנו כל הזמן הערכה דינמית, הערכה מעצבת. הסטודנט מתאים את ההוראה בהנחיה של המרצה. הוא אה, לומד יחד עם התלמיד, מקבל אינפורמציה מהמורה שמגיעה אחת לשבוע, וכל הזמן נעשה תעלה, תהליך של הערכה דינמית ושינוי של התוכנית בהתאם לצרכים ולמצב הרגשי גם של התלמיד. התלמידים, כמו שאתם כבר מבינים, מגיעים בדרך כלל עם תחושת כישלון, תחושת כישלון בתחום הדעת שלהם, בתחום הדעת שבו הם מגיעים ללמוד, ולפעמים גם תחושת כישלון כללית מבחינה לימודית, והגישה בסדנה היא בעצם לזהות את נקודות, את הכוחות של התלמיד, את נקודות החוזק שיש לו, ולאתר את הפערים ואת הנקודות לחיזוק אצלו. תוכנית ההוראה המותאמת בעצם צריכה לתת ביטוי לשניהם. בהתייחס לצד הלימודי בבחירת שיטות ההוראה ובתחום הרגשי, חברתי והתנהגותי בבחירת אמצעי ההוראה, הפעילויות ודרך הפעולה של הסטודנט עם התלמיד. גם כאן אתם יכולים לראות בתמונות את היחס האישי, יצירה של חוויית הצלחה. אני חושבת שאפשר, אחד הדברים המרגשים זה באמת לראות תלמידים שמגיעים מתוך מקום של כישלון, מתוך מקום שהם לא אוהבים ללמוד את התחום הזה, כי הוא קשה להם. וכשהם מגיעים למכללה, כל הפעילויות וכל הדרך עבודה שנעשית איתם, גורמת להם להנאה, דבר ראשון באלף, ולהנאה בעין. אז כמובן שיש אתגרים, אתגרים לא פשוטים לפעמים, יש לנו לדוגמה ארבעה תלמידים שהם לא דוברים את השפה, הם עולים חדשים מרוסיה והם דוברים רוסית, ובעצם יש אתגר גם לתלמיד וגם לסטודנט שצריך ללמוד בד בבד גם קריאה וגם את, לפני כן את השפה הדבורה. אני רוצה לסיים עם תיאור של דווקא סוף התהליך בסדנה, במפגש הכוונה. בסוף, ה... בסוף השיעור, התלמיד, בליווי של סטודנט, עומד במליאה ומציג את התהליך או את תוצר הלמידה שעבר בשיעור. הוא עומד וכל התלמידים יושבים, יש בכל קבוצה 15 תלמידים ו-15 סטודנטים, ומציג בעצם תוצר שהוא עשה. עכשיו, הוא עושה את זה בדרך כלל בביטחון רב, הוא נעזר בסטודנט שלידו, ורואים שבאמת הוא מרגיש, הוא מרגיש מאוד טוב עם מה שהוא עשה, ו... אנחנו יודעים, המורה מדווחת בדרך כלל, שאותם תלמידים לפעמים בבית ספר לא מדברים, לא משתתפים בשיעור, ופתאום הם עומדים ומציגים בגאווה גדולה. זה פשוט אה, מרגש לראות את זה, וגם מאוד יפה לראות אה, איך תלמיד מציג, ושאר התלמידים, אה, החברים שלו, יושבים קשובים, מצביעים כדי לתת לו משוב, וגם לימדו אותם איך נותנים משוב משמעותי, ואיך מפרגנים. זה תהליך שהמרצות עוברות. יחד עם התלמידים ויחד עם הסטודנטים במהלך בעצם תהליך של שנה שבהחלט נושא פירות. אז אני מבינה שכבר אין לי זמן, נכון? אז באמת לסיום. חשוב לי להדגיש שמעבר לתהליכים הנפלאים שמתרחשים בסדנאות ולכל היתרונות שקיימים. נראה כי המרחב הכללי מאפשר ומקדם את המפגש של תלמידים עם קשיים לימודיים עם האקדמיה. רבים מהתלמידים שמגיעים לסדנאות לא נחשפו עד כה לאקדמיה, גם לא במחשבות, ולאפשרויות הגלומות בעבורם בעתיד. מקום בו סטודנטים מבוגרים לומדים. המפגש הזה מאוד מעצים בפני עצמו, הם מגלים התלהבות וסקרנות רבה. הסדנאות הן ללא ספק אחד מהקורסים המשמעותיים ביותר בהכשרה עבור הסטודנטים, ולא פחות עבור התלמידים. תודה רבה. טוב, אני רוצה להודות למריה קריסטינה ונירה ועדי ואתי ודן, הזדמנות של כולנו לשאול שאלות בעברית או באנגלית. 
לכל אחד מהדוברים או הדוברות, או אם יש שאלה שלדעתכם רלוונטית לחלק מהדוברים או לכל הדוברים, בבקשה, אני רק מבקש שמי שידבר יציג את עצמו, תציג את עצמה, ונתחיל עם... על השערבי. I'm fascinated by the thought of the short school day, the four-hour day, because the tendency is to think that one learns more in more hours. Uh, however, as a feminist, I'm also interested in knowing how this affects working families. In other words, because one of the problems with the short learning day, as I'm sure you're aware in other countries, is who looks after the children when school is finished. And I'm very interested to know how you deal with that particular problem. I agree that it, it's a very, very important issue you raised, uh, raised up. Um, there's after school program and uh, it's uh, more like, uh, well, it's uh, uh, supporting to homework, if there is any homework. Uh, yeah, they serve uh, uh, little snacks also, uh, because the children has, uh, had, uh, has lunch at school already, so it's uh, snack time there. And then they play together. And usually they plan the activities in that uh, um, afternoon together with the children and uh, the social workers who are dealing with the children there. And uh, that can happen in the um, school area, in, in, uh, in schools, uh, but also um, in uh, some um, neighborhood uh, nearby the school, but usually at school area. How many hours? Um, so, uh, it they served four hours, but um, some children might be there only one hour. It depends about their parents' uh, work uh, uh, schedule. Usually in Finland, if it's possible, uh, uh, mother or father or grandmother or someone uh, are doing the first uh, fall, the short uh, day at work. If, it, if there's any possibility, and stay the afternoon with the child. But of course, it's not always possible, possible, uh, po possibility to do that, so in that case, uh, those afternoon uh, uh, activities are available. So they pay the parents? Yes, there is a little uh, payment. It's about, um, it's about that uh, snack. Uh, not, uh, not a salary of, uh, of the social workers, so it's only some euros per day, or, yeah. My name is Flamit de Fries. I'm from the Ted Aronson Family Foundation. Sizes of classrooms, and how many pupils are in, you know, in the, in the kindergarten or in uh, the, you know, first yeah. grade? It depends on the age of the children, of course. Um, in kindergarten classroom, if there is one kindergarten teacher, so 12 teachers, uh, 12 students is uh, the maximum. But if there is more, more, more students, then there has to be two teachers. In the first and second grade, uh, the average uh, number of students in the classroom is 20 to 22, but it can be up to 30 or it can be in small uh, schools with only two teachers which are not presented. We have those in rural areas still, so there can be only 15 students or even less. But uh, the average is uh, 20, 22, around that. We heard lots about inspiration and strategies, but we didn't hear a lot about dilemmas. So if you have questions also about dilemmas, please, to Professor Lippman and any of the other colleagues. No, no. 
That is a very good question, and we already talked a little bit about that with you. And uh, we really want to learn more about, the, about that issue from your country, because that is quite new issue in Finland. And only the biggest city, like the, our capital town, Helsinki, and uh, Turku, next to Helsinki, uh, has developed uh, the education system uh, quite many years already. So uh, they have... Uh, they have quite a nice way to uh, handle that situation. But in other parts of the country, it's the new issue. And uh, nowadays, we have more and more immigrants coming. And uh, so all the teachers nowadays need to deal with that. And we don't uh, used to have that kind of issue in our teacher training. So it's the challenge for professional development for the teachers. Um, it seems to be nowadays so uh, that uh, uh, when the immigrant children come to comes to school, the first uh, uh, semester is uh, uh, so-called reception class, and it's mostly about the language learning and reading and math. But as soon as possible, they are integrated to normal classrooms, and they start the integration right in the beginning with uh, art and uh, gymnastics and uh, music and those which are not academic. Uh, um, subject fields. But now we are a little bit, uh, we have a little contradictory feelings about that uh, system and uh, nowadays many schools they think that the best way is uh, uh, to take the children right away to the normal classrooms because they learn the language uh, from the peers uh, and uh, uh, from the teaching situation and uh, then we can support in other ways the language learning but not in the separate classroom. So there is a lot of things going on in that area and uh, s some overlaps also for example I, I heard it from one municipality uh, where they put all the immigrant children to special education right away, and that's not the way to do it. So, so the Minister of Education was very angry about that, and they need to, <laughs> to, to uh, make them, uh, other decisions uh, how to handle that situation. But uh, I think that that is the area we need to learn from you a lot. So, so when we started this, um, we faced uh, many challenges. One were uh, uh, prejudice against the community. Uh, there was, a, I would say, a, a, a lot of goodwill towards the Ethiopian immigrant community, but there was also a lot of not in my backyard, NIMBY. Not, it's, it's, we're happy to have them here as long as they're not in school with my children. Uh, and we found situations in in many cities where there was a de facto form of segregation going on, where the children were being isolated from uh, the children who had been living in Israel longer. I will share that we did not find that that prevented the Ethiopian Israeli children from succeeding academically. We had our, some of our highest scores in a school that was almost 100% uh, Ethiopian Israeli, but uh, obviously there was a, a deep social cost, that these children were not being integrated into the society and did not feel that they belonged to the rest of society. Also the parents. Uh, we felt we encountered a lot of attitudes toward parents uh, within the school system uh, and from other parents, uh, that the parents were a burden, that the parents uh, were from a primitive culture which had no relevance to Israeli society today, and that they could not contribute to their children's education. And one of the things we worked very hard to do by raising awareness among the faculty and by trying to empower the parents was to change those attitudes, because we knew that the parents needed to be partners. We needed to help the parents understand what they could expect from the school and the school to understand what they could expect from the parents. I'll give just one or two quick examples with, and I think you'll have this with, with any immigrant group, is that, that there's cultural codes and a lot of miscommunication. So uh, when Ethiopian children would suddenly disappear from a school for days at a time, this, the teachers and the principal would see that as the family disregarding the importance of school. What usually was happening was they were going to a funeral. 
because everyone in the community goes to the funeral and they stay for the entire shiva, they stay for the entire mourning period. They don't go for a day and come back. So we had to try to raise awareness on both sides of the cultural difference and what the cost of that behavior was in modern Israeli society. Uh, is, uh, Ethiopian children, when they're very, very young, are called by a different name by most of the significant adults in their family. Not a nickname, a completely different name. So uh, a grandfather might call a, a boy Avraham, and, and, and the grandmother might call him Yosef, and an aunt will call him Shlomo. And then when they ask a child in Hebrew, you don't say, what's your name? You say, how are you called? And the child wouldn't answer because you didn't know which name you were asking about. And they would write down, child does not know his own name, needs special education. And <clears throat> so again, social workers from the school would go to visit the families and try to get to all the Ethiopian Israeli families in one night. So they would spend five or ten minutes in each house. If you visit an Ethiopian family for the first time, you don't spend an hour or two. It's a terrible insult. So within a matter of a week, they had alienated and angered the entire community, again, with good intention. So, so, so again, we, we try to address these things as explicitly as possible to raise people's awareness. I won't say that eliminates prejudice, and I won't say that eliminates the feeling that we'd rather have the kids learning with somebody else. But it's, it's a step, uh, uh, and over time, you can change, you can change those attitudes. My name is Eli Nehama, and I'm the principal of the Bialik of Gotham campus in Tel Aviv. It's kind of a very unique school in Israel. We have 1,200 uh, kids of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrant workers who come from actually 51 different countries following all faiths and beliefs. Uh, first of all, thank you for what we heard. It's very fruitful and I'm sure that we will be able to uh, follow and maybe try in our system. But I would like to share with you uh, from our experience two uh, subjects. One, we realized that if we encourage the students to learn their own mother tongues, it's very helpful to learn them their uh, Hebrew, for example. And uh, although they are kind of confused and don't have really basic of uh, global language understanding and abilities, we really realize that at the age of 13 or 14, uh, because they, have, they come to us during all the different grades. So it doesn't matter if he's six years old or 12, um, we do it uh, by teaching them both language, languages as well. The second one is we found the connection between the culture and the language. And this is very, very important. And I'm very even proud to hear what you are doing with the Ethiopians because if I have any complaints to the Israeli system, I would ask why, as far as I knew till now, till I met you today, in the, in the Ethiopian schools, they don't have any kind of cultural music, dancing, etc., or teaching the Amharic. And I'm asking why. The same problem we have with the Arabs, the Israeli Arabs as well. We don't learn Arabic in the Jewish schools. So this is a hope or a calling from here together with you to do something in these subjects. Thank you. From what we heard today, I wonder what really makes the difference. Are these the different teaching methods or is it a social policy in the political life of the country? Because you mentioned that in Finland there are hardly any differences between the various schools. Is it because the teachers are so good and they make a difference, or simply because Finland is a good country <laughs> in the sense that it is a welfare state that doesn't allow its citizens <coughs> to go to the gutters? Therefore, the question is, it is hard to tell to what extent um, education or teaching methods are meaningless, meaning, meaningful in, in this process. And what you have to say about that, because maybe one would say that it is actually political issues of giving more equal educational opportunities to all types of all kids from all um, various types of duration. Okay, thank you for the very important question, I think. I think it's uh, not either or, it's uh, both. 
So, uh, of course, uh, um, if we look at our educational policy, the equality is the main point there, and the equal opportunity to all, and uh, um, uh, some basic education free of charge to everyone. If, uh, if they want to study as far as they can or they want. But at the same time, uh, it's about uh, the quality of teaching. So, uh, of course, there's differences between the families and the family background uh, and uh, the educational level of the parents, which is affecting to the home environment of the child and uh, uh, also what kind of social resources the child has when they come to school. So uh, we have seen that school can make a difference in those cases and uh, uh, fill the gap between the differences between the children. We have get uh, sometimes also political critics that are we trying to do all the children the same, that everybody are similar. But uh, that's not the case, but it's uh, more that uh, everybody has uh, at least the uh, possibil same possibilities and uh, we offer the same possibilities to them. About the teaching then, uh, when I was hearing uh, in the school and uh, my colleagues uh, to tonight uh, here, uh, the instructional uh, practices are not so different. But the way the teacher is doing that in the classroom, that makes the difference. So the mm, interaction between the teachers and the student and uh, the interaction in the classroom uh, between the students as well. And uh, also how sensitive the teacher is to students' needs and does the teacher answer to that needs uh, or give the resources and support the child's learning. So I think that's, uh, that's the way to go. Uh, it's not so much about some trick that uh, are you teaching uh, uh, letter names first or phonemes first. So I think that's a more or less technique. But uh, uh, it's the way you are doing things with the children. Mm. government, of the importance of the role, okay, of the teacher as the game changer, as the person, okay, who uh, can inspire the student, and that is the, the way the government treats them in the position, and therefore maybe, you know, the interaction with the families, the relationship, the trust, the, the school, okay, that the teacher, okay, is really a very important uh, person in the life of the children, it's a child. And yes. I think in Israel, we are, that's a big dilemma, you know, and a challenge. I totally agree with you, and uh, um, I can tell you that uh, it's amazing how popular uh, profession, uh, teacher profession is in Finland. Um, last spring, uh, uh, our national newspaper Helsingin Sanomat has a big survey among the um, uh, graduate uh, students from the upper secondary school and ask their most favorite profession they want to continue to have their studies in which program. And the teacher program was the most uh, popular one and after that came the doctor and then the lawyer. And then engineering. So, <laughs> of course, uh, that, that, uh, that tells something about the society and the respect to teachers. And the other thing uh, in the numbers is that, for example, last spring there was 1,500 uh, applicants to our teacher training program, and we got uh, we take in uh, only uh, 19, 90, sorry, 90, yeah, 90. nine zero, yes, 90. I think the. Uh headline of tonight's um, evening is in Hebrew, Acharai Lechinuch, especially in light of your last comments. And I'll pass on the, thank you, the mic to Suzanne to wrap up. Thank you all very much for your interesting, insightful uh, presentations. And I would like to invite you all to continue the question and answers around a cup of coffee 
uh, that we have served in the room next door. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.